Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston, North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and it's good to say 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're over the, uh, the hump, so uh, we're uh, working toward the backside of the book. Okay, uh, and uh, what we've been looking at, for those of you who haven't been with us, is that uh, Paul has been talking to the church and uh, talking to them about exercising Christian liberty. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are free. That is, we are not under the uh, constraint or the confines of the Mosaic law. We don't have to follow the Jewish dietary laws of the Israelites in the Old Testament. We are free. Paul says... Uh, all things are uh, lawful for me, however, though, not all things are profitable. That is, that a Christian needs to learn how to temper their Christian liberty because they don't want to be a stumbling block to those uh, who view uh, food and perhaps sometimes some drink as something that might be inherently wrong. Uh, for example, those of you who may have grown up either Catholic or grew up in a Presbyterian background, Perhaps drinking wine was something that was normative for your family. I know in a lot of Presbyterian churches, for example, such as the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, they actually have wine during communion. However, someone may have had, have had a background where uh, they come out of uh, uh, a family that was plagued by alcoholism. And so they have uh, an, an immediate uh, distaste uh, and disdain for uh, alcoholic beverages. And so when you put those types of Christians together, uh, as particularly if this one who comes out of a background of alcoholism and has been around that and you put them around alcohol, uh, that may be a stumbling block for them because it tempts them to go back into sin. And so Paul is telling the church, that is true, church, we are free. However, our liberty needs to be tempered against the backdrop of not offending a weaker brother or sister in Christ. Now, Paul specifically is using meat that has been sacrificed to an idol. That is not really a problem for people in our contemporary culture, unless you live overseas in some other uh, country, but here in the United States, well, you know, there's not uh, just a bunch of temples around here that are having barbecues in the back, with the result that uh, people are, you know, making sacrifices to these temples, and then we have other people who are going and saying, you know, I, I don't want to eat steak from uh, that particular temple because that's going to bring me back into that type of uh, sacrificial worship to these idols. We don't struggle with that. But there are things in our society where people may struggle. Paul doesn't want to give a laundry list because he doesn't want to create a, a atmosphere of legalism. It would be very easy, for example, for me to tell you and give you a long list of don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. OK, uh, we can go ahead and just uh, say the lesson's been wrapped up now. Just don't do these things and you'll be OK. However, if I were to do that and just give you a laundry list of things and you would leave here today, it wouldn't really mean anything because, number, first of all, I have no authority to, uh, to do that. That is to speak for myself in the sense of give, giving you a laundry list. And so Paul understands that that's why he doesn't give the church a laundry list of things. As a matter of fact, it has confused a lot of Bible expositors here in chapter 9. Because if you'll recall when I was with you last time, and we talked about not being a stumbling block to the weaker brother or sister, and then Paul immediately transitions over into something a lot of preachers have used, but it doesn't quite seem to fit with the argument of what Paul is trying to labor. And what Paul is laboring is, how does the Christian exercise their liberty 
in light of where the Bible gives no restrictions. Paul is dealing with that in chapters 8 through 10. And so what we're going to see this morning then is that chapter 9, uh, we're going to do the first half this week and then the second half next week. But what we're going to see is that in verses 1 through 14, Paul establishes his right as an apostle to exercise his liberty. So Paul is going to talk about his rights to exercise his liberty. And then next week in verses 15 through 27, which is the latter part of the chapter, we're going to talk about how Paul restricts the exercise of his liberty for the sake of the brothers and the sisters in the church. So this week Paul is talking about his rights. Next week Paul will talk about his restrictions. And why is that? Because Paul... Ultimately, his goal is that by exercising and setting the example of tempering his Christian liberty, he can save some. His primary concern was the salvation of everyone who came within earshot of his preaching of the gospel. Now, Paul is going to use something in order to labor his argument. He's not going to talk about eating meat sacrificed to idols. What he's going to talk about is money. What he's going to talk about specifically is that the church should be giving financial support to its ministers, specifically Paul and Barnabas. Because they were the ones who were there ministering in Corinth. The people of Corinth lived in a very wicked society. It's quite likely that many of them did not trust their preachers in uh, the churches in the surrounding areas. We know for a fact that there were so-called super apostles that were in this Corinthian church. That was that they, they were a thorn in Paul's side the whole time that he has to minister there. Uh, he will begin to address them over in 2 Corinthians. Uh, but just like in Paul's day, we have ministers today that are a thumb in the side of the true church. Because these ministers like to get on television and ask people for money. And there have been scandal after scandal over the last 20 to 30 years with these televangelists. Uh, people who use sticks and gimmicks and all these other uh, questionable means to try to manipulate people into sending them money. With a result that they live lavish lifestyles. And squander the money deceiving God's people. There's going to be a special place in hell for people like that. People who Jesus said have caused the least of these to stumble. So people have an, an adversity uh, in reference to paying for pastors and preachers and so forth to begin with. Because of guys like this and gals like this. And such was probably the case in Paul's day. But Paul realizes he doesn't want to give the church a laundry list of do's and don'ts. But he has to convey this message about how to temper the Christian liberty. How is the best way to do that? Paul reasons the best way to use that is to use him as an example. And that's exactly what he does. In our study this morning, we're going to be looking at the first 14 verses of chapter 9. We're going to see Paul's argument. Why is Paul able to exercise his rights and why is he able to demand of the Corinthian church certain things? Well, first and foremost, we're going to see that Paul argues that he has the right to exercise apostolic authority and the right to be paid by the church because of his position. We see that in verses 1 through 7. And then verses 8 through 11, we'll see that Paul is going to labor that he has the right to be supported by the church because of prescription. Uh, that is, because it has been mandated through the Bible. In verses 12, because of precedence, Paul is going to labor that, hey, you guys are already paying ministers here. Why is it that me and Barnabas are being treated differently? And then and finally, in verses 13 and 14, we're going to see that it is because of pattern. There was an Old Testament law establishing it, but we also see that the New Testament pattern for paying ministers uh, is something that was established by Christ himself. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for those of you that are visiting, I'm not a staff member here. I don't get paid by the church. So before you think, well, here's another guy who's talking about money 
who is looking at preachers who are asking about money and being somewhat critical of them. No, what I'm doing is telling you how Paul is arguing. Okay? So I don't have an iron in the fire, so to speak. So let's look here then at verse 1 as Paul begins this argument. Paul argues that he has the right to ask of financial support from the church because of his position. And he's going to labor his argument by way of an analogy. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Now he's asking these questions and he's asking these questions rhetorically. All of these answers or all of the answers assumes an affirmative response. Am I not free? Paul is saying, you know, you all in the church, you're saying I'm free in Christ. We can do whatever way we want to do. Paul is saying, a a am I not free? Am I like you? Am I not free as well? H haven't I believed in Jesus? But then he goes on to say, a am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? And are you not my work in the Lord? His appeal is to his apostolic authority. Now, what's the big deal with that? Well, consider the term apostles. I know today, if you turn on Christian television, so-called, you'll see apostle so-and-so down at uh, First Presbyterian Church. Talking about coming to the healing service tonight and bring your prayer cloth. I can tell you that one may be an apostle because apostle simply means one who is sent. It comes from the Greek word apostolos and it means the sent one. So in a sense, we are all apostles in the sense that if we go from one place to another to share the gospel, then we are being sent. That is being commissioned by uh, the Lord, Matthew 18, when he uh, gave, or Matthew 19. 28, uh, 19, when he said to go out into the world and preach the gospel, making disciples and baptizing and teaching. So in a sense, if we're doing that, we are ones who were sent. But Paul is not using it in those terms. What Paul is saying is that he is an apostle, that is, one who has been specifically commissioned by Christ to engage in formal ministry. That's the term of how he is using the word apostle. Consider what he says. He says, therefore, it is necessary that the men who have accompanied us all that time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from, of, from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, what's going on here? And you don't see it here. It's on the next slide. Uh, but this is a quote from the book of Acts. What's happened is, you'll recall that Judas hanged himself because he betrayed the Lord. So the twelve went down to number eleven. So the question for the disciples is, uh, how are we going to replace Judas? So what they're doing is they are coming together to formulate a plan about how they are going to pick the next apostle, capital A. <clears throat> so they put forward two men. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called, called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show us which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Now, it wasn't so much that they were rolling the dice. You'll recall that this is before Pentecost. This is before the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere are we instructed to cast lots or dice today in order to try to discern the will of God. There is true, there is an Old Testament proverb that every decision is from the Lord, that casting lots and so forth. Uh, however, we have the indwelling presence of the Spirit today. We are instructed to make our decisions on the basis of wisdom rather than on the basis of chance or casting lots. But in any case, what had happened is we have two qualified disciples, Justice and Matthias. 
And Matthias was selected to replace Judas. They had to be a witness to the resurrection Christ, resurrected Christ. They had to be uh, with him from the beginning to the end, cradle to the grave, so to speak, and then resurrection. However, Paul was not part of the 12 disciples. He didn't come to prominence in his ministry until after Jesus had already ascended. So how, how does Paul figure into the equation? How does he become an apostle, capital A? We have it with the twelve. Jesus commissioned the disciples. But Paul wasn't part of that. Well, consider his conversion. Paul, you recall, was a Pharisee. A very educated Pharisee. Who took it upon himself, believing he was doing the will and the work of God by persecuting this new group, this new sect of Judaism called the Way. And he thought that if he could eradicate these Christians off the face of the planet, he would be doing a service to God. And so he is on his way to arrest and drag Christians out of their homes and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. And as he was traveling, Acts 9 tells us, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a, a disciple uh, at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to street called Straight. And inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. And he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. <clears throat> But Ananias said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem and here at his authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, watch this, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. So how is it then that Paul can claim Apostolic authority, that is, claim prominence just like the original 12 disciples. The reason being is because he was specifically commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself. That is why Paul has apostolic authority. That is why he is an apostle. Moreover, Paul also says, look, I, I'm not going to pull out my apostle ID card. You know, a lot of times when we go places, particularly being in law enforcement, we can get in out of places most people can't. All we do, show them our police ID. Boom, you go right in. Paul didn't do that so much with him as far as pull out his apostolic card and say, okay, don't worry, the situation's well in hand. I'm here. Paul made an appeal as, his, as an apostolic authority. However, his appeal was much more personal. Because he appealed to these believers in Corinth him, their, themselves. Their faith, you see, rested on God working through Paul's ministry to call many of them to faith in Christ. And so Paul argues by comparison. We see that in verse 1. Also in verses 2 through 7, though, we see that he argues from convention. That is, what's normative or what's practice. So he argues by comparison, saying, I'm just like you, except 
being apostle, but also to know that you wouldn't even exist as a church unless the Lord had sent me to come here and I preach the gospel. And through that preaching of the gospel, the Lord opened your understanding with a result that you believed. But moreover, Paul says, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? Even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, that is Peter. Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends the flock and does not use the milk of the flock? These are very powerful, powerful arguments. And there is a point to why Paul is using all of these illustrations, saying that they were the seal of his apostleship. You'll recall that a seal is something uh, in the olden days, and they even use it today in the trucking industry. But in the olden days, if a, a document or something had to be sent officially, then what they would do, for example, is they would write out something on parchment. They would roll up the parchment. They would take wax and dip it on where the, the, uh, uh, the lip of the paper is, where it makes contact. And then they would take a signet ring or a seal and they would stamp it into the wax. So that when the person who received the letter looked at the letter, he could tell that the letter was authentic because the seal was on the letter and the seal had not been broken. That was the stamp of the authenticity of whatever it is that the seal was on. And Paul is saying that the church, that the people in the church, you are the seal of the authenticity of my ministry. That is Paul's point. In addition to that, he says that Christian ministers, speaking not only of himself, but these other uh, teachers, you'll recall Corinth had a lot of teachers in them. There was Apollos and, and uh, Peter was there as, as well. Uh, probably Ananias and Sapphira led some type of, not Ananias and Sapphira, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, that's in Acts 5, uh, Priscilla and Aquila uh, held some type of Bible study ministry there. But his point is this, Christian ministers should be financially supported by the church. Christian ministers should be financially supported by the church. Consider what MacArthur says in reference to this verse. He says, I believe that the verse supports the principle of paying pastors, evangelists, missionaries, and other such Christian workers enough so that their wives do not have to work. And the reason he gets that is because Paul labors the argument... Don't, don't, don't we have a right to take along a believing wife? Even mentioning Peter and Peter's wife. We know Peter was married because you recall from the gospel accounts that Christ heals Peter's mother-in-law. And if you have a mother-in-law, that presupposes that you have a wife. Okay? You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure that one out. Right? And so... What Paul is saying is, doesn't Peter have a right to bring a wife with him in ministry? Well, the only way he could do that is if the church not only supported for Peter's needs, but also supported for his wife's needs. One of the things that uh, a lot of churches in talking with pastors in reference to conferences uh, told me is that uh, when they have something, and I have one of my classmates who's about to have a conference up in Oklahoma uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, but one of the things that, that the churches do is when they invite a speaker to come in, they'll say, we, we want to support you to come in, but we would also like to support your wife if she wants to come too. And why is that? Because every married person in here knows that if you're out doing something, specifically ministry-wise, that it's great to have that base of support from your wife while you're there. Because that's someone who's going to be able to assist you, someone who's going to be able to pray with you, someone who's going to be able to encourage you like no other person on the face of this earth. Paul understood that. And that's why he says, don't, don't we have a right to bring a spouse as well? 
MacArthur continues, I believe it supports the principle of paying pastors, evangelists, missionaries, and other such Christian workers enough so that their wives don't have to work. The point is that when it is possible for her to go along, every effort should be made by the sponsoring group to pay her way to. It is a question of the right attitude. The attitude of generosity in supporting the Lord's full-time workers. So Paul argues then, because of his position, because of prescription. <clears throat> so he's argued that because he's an apostle, he's argued because it makes good sense in the sense of being able to bring the, uh, your support with you. And then he also uses, which we're not really going to labor for the sake of time, but he uses three illustrations in order to say this when he talks about a soldier, uh, a farmer, and a shepherd. All of those are a type to describe the work of the pastor. A soldier who serves, as Craig said this morning, doesn't entangle themselves with the things going on in the world because they would be less effective. Paul uses the same, uh, uh, the, the, the thrust of the same argument here in talking about a soldier. A soldier can't be divided between his uh, military duty and trying to go out into the world and get some type of civilian job working at a factory. His attention is divided. It is up to the, the soldier to protect. That is one of the things that soldiers, policemen, firemen, uh, first responders, their job is to protect, protect people. The pastor's job in the church is to protect the church. Protect the church from what? Protect the church from false doctrine. To make sure that wrong biblical teaching doesn't creep its way into the church. Beloved, false teaching is everywhere. And it's very subtle how it comes into the church. Like a cancer, it begins to permeate through the congregation and will cause divisiveness, uh, if anything else. But also, he says that the pastor is a farmer. In the same way that a farmer goes out to work in a field, we would think it was crazy if the farmer wasn't able to get even the produce from the field, or at least some of it. Or the same way that a shepherd goes out and manages a flock. That he doesn't have the right to get at least some milk from the flock? Certainly he does in all three of those cases. But then Paul transitions that argument to say, okay, I'm using these illustrations that you guys would know. But in addition to that, it's also God's word. So it's not just by my having saying that I'm an apostle. It's not by these, these cute analogies, but it's also based upon the very law of God. Look at verse 8. He says, I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? And the answer is no. Or does not the law also say these things? And the answer is yes. He says, for it is written in the law of Moses. Now here he's making a reference to Deuteronomy 25. You shall not muzzle an ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about the oxen, is He? Or is He speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake, it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. So if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much to ask if we reap material things from you? The answer to that is no. Now, before we think that Paul is not being very kind to animals, that's not what he's talking about. He's making an argument. He's making an argument from the lesser to the greater. And again, he's using it by way of an analogy. He's talking about ox who are allowed to eat while they are threshing. Now, unless you grew up on a farm and you dealt with animals and so forth, uh, sometimes you would put muzzles on animals to make them work. Uh, under the Mosaic law, you would not do that. Because the animal is out there working, the animal has a right every once in a while to reach down, you know, grab a big mouthful of, of uh, grain or food or whatever it is that they're working on, and to eat as they go. God is simply saying, allow the animal to eat as he goes. Why? Because the animal is out there working. So the animal is working in the field, but he ought to reap the benefit of the field. Likewise, now Paul switches to the greater, 
Ministers are out there working and sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel. Therefore, they ought to benefit financially from those with whom they are ministering the gospel to. So he's using an argument from agriculture to illustrate the point that ministers need to be paid. It's because of his position. It's prescription, that is, it's biblically commanded but also we see its precedence. Look at verse 12. The Corinthian church supported previous ministers. He says, if others share the right over you, do we not more? Now, he doesn't tell us specifically who these others are. He doesn't name them by name. But it should be relatively easy to figure out because remember in the early part of 1 Corinthians, we have the church divided over the various teachers in the church and these teachers are named Apollos remember Cephas or Peter and then Paul and again you probably have second tier teachers as well that were associated or aligned themselves with these groups as well and what Paul is saying is these other folks you supported them don't we have a right to be supported by you if not even more nevertheless he says we did not use this right, but we endure all things. Why? So that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. They tempered their demands for payment for the sake of these believers in the church. MacArthur again notes the Corinthians apparently had always supported their pastors. Those they now supported or had supported doubtlessly included Apollos and Peter. As the church's founding pastor and as an apostle, Paul had more claim on their support than any other pastor. But he did not use this right. So what did Paul do? Remember, Paul tells us over in the book of Acts, or, or Luke tells us over in the book of Acts, when Paul came into the church, or when Paul came to Corinth to establish the church, after Paul began to establish the church and the church began to grow, he kept his day job, which was tent making. We find that over in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. After these things, he left Athens. That's where he was before the philosophers and the learned people uh, on top of Mars Hill, where they accused him of bringing strange new doctrines to the Greeks. And after he left Athens, he went to Corinth and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native from Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and they were working for by trade, they were tent makers. A lot of times people have debated specifically what this tent making is. Some, think, some say that uh, it was something that... Uh, tapestries for the Roman army, uh, but recall Paul was a rabbinical student, a Pharisee. Uh, if he grew up being uh, identified with that job, it's quite possible that the tents that he was making may have been some type of religious garb or what have you. But regardless of what these tents were, Paul supported himself while he was at Corinth. We'll later find out that the churches of Macedonia will send Paul a love gift Remember, Paul will say they gave out of their poverty. So imagine he's here in Corinth. He's out there working nine to five and then he's going into the church and teaching the folks that night and teaching on the Sabbath. They offer him no support whatsoever. All of a sudden, someone comes with a love gift down from the churches in Macedonia. And Paul's able to stop working as a tent maker. Now, do you think if you're in the congregation, you would have put two and two together and say, wow, we probably should have been paying that guy all along. But there's no mention of that. It goes to show you how immature they were and how they related with each other. They were divisive, fighting over teachers. They weren't spiritually sensitive in order to be taking care of the needs of those who were meeting their spiritual needs. And Paul was there for 18 months. But because of precedence, they should have paid Paul, but they didn't. And he didn't ask it of them. And then finally, because of the pattern. Look at verse 13. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple 
and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Now understand this. Corinth was a Greek city. There were Jews that were in the congregation, but it's quite likely they made up a minority in that congregation. We know that in the short term that Paul was with them, how he must have poured himself into their teaching. Why? Because notice when he writes this, he doesn't give verse and, and text of the Old Testament. He immediately assumes they already know about the sacrificial system, the Levitical priesthood, bringing sacrifices, how the priests were able to share in the sacrifices in order to maintain themselves and their families. None of that stuff is stated. It is assumed, which means what? It means Paul was a very good teacher because he can just make an allusion to it in passing and know that they would understand exactly what he's talking about. The Old Testament priest, for those of us who may not know what he's talking about, under the Levitical law, God had established the Levites to be the priests. In other words, they were to take the offerings of the people and present them to God in the tabernacle before the temple and then in the temple after the tabernacle. Moses says in the book of Numbers, he writes, only the Levites shall perform the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the sons of Israel. They shall have no inheritance. You recall that when the twelve tribes of Israel came into the promised land, each of the tribes was given a piece or portion of land as an inheritance, except for the Levites. The preachers didn't get any land. God had mandated that that tribe would be supported by the 11 other tribes in order to sustain them. And how were they going to do that? Through the sacrificial system. Through the offerings. He says, they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites. For an inheritance. Therefore I have said concerning them. They shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. So that was the principle and pattern established under the Mosaic law. Jesus in making an allusion to that and referencing that. Says this in the New Testament. He's sending out the disciples. And he tells them go. Behold I send you out as lambs in the midst of the wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. And he's speaking specifically about the apostles or the disciples and that the disciples would be supported and sustained by those whose houses they lived in. That is those who took them in. This again is setting the precedent for how the church should support its pastoral staff. We know that because Paul will use that exact quote over his, uh, in the book of Timothy. MacArthur notes, Paul had the right to ask for support because the Lord had ordained the principle. Those who proclaim the gospel are to get their living from the gospel. Both God's law and God's son teach that his prophets, teachers, and ministers are to be paid for the work in their Lord. The New Testament teaching reiterates that of the Old Testament teaching as well. The Levites were to have their support from the people in the Old Testament under the law. Under the dispensation of the church age, the church is to support its pastoral staff financially. So what are the, some things that we can take away from this? Because Paul has hit the church pretty hard. Now granted, we're stopping there in the middle. Paul's argument will continue next week. We'll look at that as he begins to talk about how he restricts his liberty. But there are some things that I think in principle that we can take away from what Paul is trying to labor for the church. Paul gave up certain rights to advance the gospel. <clears throat> that is, he didn't want to place a stumbling block before the church. 
So he didn't ask them for money when he had the right to do so as an apostle. What is God asking you to restrict? What is he asking you to curb? So that you're able to go out and reach people for the gospel or with the gospel. I can't give you a list. I can't tell you what to give up. Because the minute that I say you need to give up whatever that fill in the blank is that I say. That's going to be a legalistic definition for you. Only you know that. And if you don't know that you need to pray that the spirit of God would make you sensitive to discern that. And he'll do it. But we need to ask ourselves, what is it that I can curb in order to not place a stumbling block in front of another brother or sister in Christ? Secondly, ministers who work in the church deserve the church's support. It's funny, I'm reminded of a story MacArthur tells in reference to missionaries going into the church. And I've even seen this uh, not so much at this church, but at other churches, if you grew up in church, or those of you who perhaps may remember, you know, you get the missionary that comes in and uh, they show stories about what God is doing through their ministries over in these third world countries. And I'll be honest with you, I've been in church a long time. I've never met a rich missionary. Never. And MacArthur makes note that and again, I can fully see it in my mind's eye. You know, the missionary will come in and the person will come in and say, oh, you know, we want to support you. So they'll take them out, uh, uh, you know, and take them over to, to Goodwill or what have you. Or they will give them a hand me down suit. You know, something that's been in the back of your closet for the last 20 years. It's made out of polyester, has white stitching in it. All right. Here, brother, so and so, let me give you this. Thinking, in some sense, they're trying to support the man of God or the woman of God. <laughs> no. Here's what you do. You take that person out and you buy them a suit. Whatever they want, you buy it. And then you let them worry about how they're going to be a steward over what you gave them. It can be with clothes. It can be with resources. It can be with anything. But be generous in our giving. For the Lord loves a cheerful giver, does He not? And then finally, perhaps you're here this morning and you're saying, okay, you're talking about Christian liberty and curbing Christian liberty. And you're not even a Christian. That is, you're, you're not even at ground one yet. You're not even at the starting line. Perhaps the Spirit of God has been working through you this morning. And as we have gone through Paul's argument, you've come to realize that you don't find yourself anywhere on the page. You're not an amateur Christian who needs to be cajoled or encouraged to do the right thing. You have an emptiness in your life somewhere. These Christians need to give up something, but if you're not a believer, what are you able to give up this morning? You ask yourself. And the answer is God only wants one thing from you. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to believe in Him. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, We shall never find happiness by looking at our prayers, our doings, or our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. If you're looking for rest for your soul, believe in Him, trust in Him. And He truly will give you peace, give you rest in your soul. Okay. All right, well, when we come back next week, we're going to pick up with verse 15. We're going to go down and finish chapter 9, get into chapter 10. That's going to have a little bit of history in there, along with a little bit of theology. So that's uh, looking forward to that. And I'm also looking forward to a little bit later on just to refresh myself, because as soon as we uh, finish up this section regarding Christian liberty, then we're going to be getting into uh, chapter 11.
how to deal with issues in the church, specifically the Lord's Supper. We have people, Christians who were dying because they were getting liquored up at the Lord's table. And then in chapter 12 through 14, we're going to be dealing with spiritual gifts. A lot of debatable things going on in those chapters. So uh, for those of you who are visiting, I hope you'll come back and join us. Uh, for the old friends that we haven't seen in a while uh, but are here this morning, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.